Well, I'll begin. Um, there are some voices that say that uh, ministries of mercy are bound to corrode um, ministry of proclamation. Um, if you indulge in those sorts of things, sooner or later the cross itself becomes eclipsed. Um, how would you respond to that? And if we should be involved in such ministry, what safeguards can we introduce so that we don't fall into the traps that historically have taken place? I actually don't think that at the uh, the program level, uh, at the level of saying uh, we shouldn't have as too many people deployed or we shouldn't put this much money into the budget, into this or that, we need to keep it balanced or we need to give a priority. I don't think that's the level at which you safeguard it. I think, I think actually the, the gospel of grace, uh, if it is preached in such a way that we see sin as offense to God, uh, we see uh, substitutionary atonement as the way in which that offense is taken away. We see that we're justified by grace alone. If the, if the implications of that gospel are the motivation for doing mercy and justice ministry to the poor, um, on the one hand, that's going to actually increase the number of uh, uh, involvements with the poor, but it's also going to keep the social gospel out because the social gospel collapses evangelism into social improvement and says that is the good news. The good news is we're going to make the world a better place. And that's only possible if you lose, lose the old-fashioned classic confessional evangelical gospel. So I actually think the answer is a theological one. If you're, if you're preaching with passion that old gospel, it gives you the impetus to do a ministry to the poor but also keeps you from the, uh, the, the disproportionate emphasis on ministry to the poor. Yeah, it might be good not to assume that uh, at least the watchers of this event agree that mercy ministries, deed ministries, ministries to the poor mm -hmm. is a given. Mm -hmm. I mean, you ask us to defend it uh, or figure out how it doesn't co-opt the gospel, but I just want to affirm it exists. Mm -hmm. In other words, the Bible said, Galatians says, do good to all men, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Mm -hmm. And the parable of the uh, uh, Good Samaritan right. is designed to get in the face of people who say, who is my neighbor? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the answer comes back, not with the answer he expected, mm -hmm. but are you a neighbor? Mm -hmm. So just, just all that to say yes to the problem. Yes. I mean, we've got to create it for a lot of people probably that who aren't engaged mm. in caring for the poor, especially the poor who haven't measured up to their expectations mm. of being deserving of their help. And so there's plenty in the New Testament, it seems to me, to say uh, don't buy into the arguments against helping the poor because they don't meet the right qualifications. Oh. Now, having said amen to that, then, then we get right. to your answer to his question right. of... Uh, how you keep compassion from sweeping away a concern for evangelism. And I think, I mean, this is the way my old-fashioned fundamentalist evangelistic dad affected me. Um, it's very hard to give up on the gospel if you believe that there's hell. That after this life, there is an endless suffering for those who did not believe in the gospel. And therefore, my take on the prioritization of these things, the way I, I like to say it at Bethlehem anyway, is we exist to relieve all suffering, especially eternal suffering. And the especially there is a, is a prioritization of, of time and of intensity. If, if I succeeded totally, in relieving all poverty in this age and didn't solve the eternal problem, I would prove in the end to be absolutely unloving and unchristlike. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world yeah. and loses his own soul? Yeah. So as far as safeguards go, mm -hmm. it seems to me continuing an orthodox grasp on the eternality of the torment of conscious hell. If a person really believes in that and preaches that way, then 
those who are starting to become enamored by um, a transformational way to do Christianity that starts to minimize the gospel, they're just not going to like that. And so if the gospel coalition that we uh, have been pulled together by can, can keep just saying these true, deep, powerful things at the center of the gospel, those who are leaning towards distortion or abandonment or minimization are just going to they're not going to get near this. And I think that's our calling. I, I think w when I try to figure out the relative balance and strategies of doing mercy ministries in New York mm -hmm. or Deerfield or Minneapolis, I, I, I get confused. I, I don't know how, what the best strategies are. And so trying to figure out what the safeguards are there, I think that's what you were saying. Mm -hmm. it, it, it just, I feel undoable. No. And so I figure, okay, what can I do? And I, I can go to the Bible and say, here there are a few things that if you say them and believe them, they function as ballast right. in your boat right. so that the winds of distortion and minimization don't, don't go away. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Don't knock us over. I, I absolutely agree with John. I mean, I think some people listening to this, uh, nobody should get the impression that when we say uh, that you have to give gospel evangelistic ministry uh, the pride of place in the church uh, some people may be saying well what you're really saying it's a, that's the old Greek dualism of you're saying the soul matters and the body doesn't matter it's not what we're saying we're mm -hmm. saying the eternal matters more than the temporal mm -hmm. uh, not, we would never say that uh, uh, because the, the, this body is you know the body is bad or matter is bad or unimportant that therefore we don't take care of people who are suffering I, I, for John to say uh, eternal suffering especially is absolutely right because actually it's common sense if there is eternal yeah. suffering. It is, it, but we're, we're, so we're just saying that the, the eternal is more important than the temporary, not that the body is less important than the soul. But having said that, I think a balance in the way in which a church ministers will come out of this formulation that we're talking about. If there's an asymmetry where you're giving pride of place to evangelism, that doesn't eat up at least it hasn't in my experience, uh, the ministry of uh, caring for the poor. In fact, I think it gives it an impetus. And I'm looking forward to churches that actually, in the actual way in which they are working, keep that balance because they give the gospel priority. There'll be a balance in the way the ministry goes because they give the gospel priority. I, I do think if you don't give the gospel priority, you actually lose the balance and you end up being a church that's just trying to improve social conditions. So let me come back at you or, or either of you with this because the answer to this question will clarify, I think, for some what we're saying. If we believe what we've just said about the prioritization of the word and of the gospel over against feeding the poor, does that then imply that where we're not succeeding in getting converts in our combined mercy word ministries, we just back off of the of the of the uh, deed ministry and just go somewhere that's more fruitful. Is that implied? Absolutely not. No. Uh, in exactly the same way that if the Lord calls you to some place where there are not a lot of converts right. and you are engaged in active evangelism and there's not a lot of fruit, you should go somewhere where there is a lot of fruit. Some there's a lot of people who say that. Oh, I know, it's horrendous. It's horrendous. And I, uh, partly I got a visceral reaction because my dad worked for so many years in a context where there was almost nothing. But, but how are you going to look at missionaries who've gone to Japan and missionaries who've gone to South Korea and say that all the ones who went to South Korea were right smack in the center of God's will and the ones that went to Japan are all a bunch of failures? What can you say? Some people are called to really hard, um, dry times, like Isaiah in, in chapter 6. You're to preach until there's so much judgment that your message is actually evoking the unbelief. And, and, and so when we... When we get involved in, in mercy ministry or in word ministry, we need to learn to be faithful without calculating our faithfulness on the basis of our fruitfulness. Mm -hmm. That finally you have to leave in God's hands. Mm -hmm.